All right, I'm going to wing this a little bit. Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club, the place where news happens. I'm Tara Kopp, the Pentagon reporter for the Associated Press and member of the National Press Club Board of Governors. I'm going to officially gavel us in so we can get this started. So first of all, thank you very much for joining us for our Headliners Newsmaker event this afternoon with three distinguished guests. To my left, the Foreign Minister of Lithuania, Gabriela Slensburgis. The Foreign Minister of Estonia, Margus Sagna. And the Foreign Minister of Latvia, Christianis Karns. We are happy to accept your questions over email, so please send us notes at headliners at press.org and put Baltics in the subject line if you have any questions. I'm going to sit down to start a conversation with so much going on in the world right now and so much of it pointed directly at the Baltics. So if you'll just follow me to the chair. I think this is much better. So given that it's Washington and uh, it's spring, we're finally passing a budget. And on Saturday, Congress passed a $1.2 trillion budget that included $228 million for Baltic security. I wanted to start with this as a pivot point for each of you. Um, you're on the front lines. Russia is literally on your border. How are you handling this? And with this additional money that has come in, um, what do you see as a relationship with the US uh, growing from this point forward? Oh, um, well, thank you very much for the question. Uh, so in the Baltics, uh, also in Latvia, uh, our first line of defense is our own budget. So we are investing in our defense. We don't view ourselves as only consumers of security, but also as uh, pitching in our own. Uh, this year, it looks like we're going to be uh, just over 3% uh, of our defense spending uh, on, uh, uh, of our GDP on defense spending. Uh, we are purchasing new uh, defensive weapon systems, uh, air defense, coastal defense, uh, HIMARS uh, rocket systems. We've reinstated the draft. We're increasing the size of our military and the size of our uh, uh, usable and uh, uh, active and prepared and equipped uh, reserves. Uh, we have been active in the past in NATO missions abroad in Afghanistan. Uh, in Iraq, uh, we're in the K-4 mission now, uh, and we, we are pitching in and are encouraging all of our uh, NATO allies to do the same. And the relationship with the U.S. in this time has been uh, tremendous. Uh, we have continual U.S. troop presence uh, in Latvia on top of uh, many other NATO allies in the so-called enhanced forward presence, which is throughout uh, the east uh, in uh, NATO. Uh, and uh, with these funds that we'll be receiving uh, coming from uh, Congress, a good portion of that will actually end up coming back to the U.S. taxpayer because we will be buying uh, arms and weapons with that. And uh, uh, a lot of what we buy is sourced right here uh, in the United States. Yes, sir. Well, thank you. First of all, it's a great honor to, to be here in this, uh, this building and this, uh, this organization. Uh, and uh, ready to talk about our relations. And today actually is the, the day when we, okay, when we uh, mark uh, 75 years of the mass deportation from the Baltic states. 75 years ago, uh, close to 100,000 uh, our people, ma mainly women and children, they were deported by the Soviet Union. And uh, we see the exact th same things happening in Ukraine. And also this week we celebrate uh, 20 years as a full members of NATO. And uh, 20 years is a long, long time for us because we have really uh, improved ourselves uh, economically and also on the security level and defense security level. And uh, I just say it again here in front of you that uh, without this full membership of NATO 20 years ago, probably we couldn't sit here as a foreign minister of ministers of uh, independent countries, of Baltic states. So that's how we feel now in front line of, of Russia. And uh, our relations with the US uh, has been really, really critically good. Really good. Because the US has invested a lot and also we have boots on the ground, all the countries uh, in the front line. But as well, this uh, decision from Congress uh, about uh, funding us 
and totally agree with my colleague that mainly this money comes back to US economy and even more. So we, uh, now Estonia is paying 3.2% uh, of GDP to defense. We have increased taxes for that. And, but people understand that we must invest now to our defense. Not only independent defense, but also altogether. We have a common procurement. And also Estonia is buying, uh, as a one example, uh, more than $300 million worth HIMARS uh, rocket systems for, from Arkansas, uh, Lockheed Martin. So uh, we are uh, having very close relations on, on that level as well, that uh, we are working very closely with the uh, defense industry of US about weapons. But as well, uh, what we see is that uh, we need to invest more as European Union, and we do it. And Estonia has given uh, to Ukraine, which is crucial because Ukraine is fighting uh, not only for their own freedom, and not only for uh, our freedom altogether and the values, but also instead of us. So we see that we must give the rapid support, the military support to Ukraine. So we have given 1.5% of GDP military support to Ukraine, and we will continue it. And we just decided last week the next package of uh, ammunition mainly to Ukraine. But also we are going to sign a bilateral agreement with Ukraine, long-term commitment, uh, about 0.25% uh, of GDP per year, the military support. And if all allies would do that, we will invest and support uh, annually, every year, uh, more than one, $120 billion worth of military support. And then we can understand as well that Ukraine is able to push Russia back because Russia is a threat for all of us, all of us, not only for our region and not, not only for Ukraine, but all of us. So, so we value a lot this cooperation, what we have uh, with U.S., and U.S. is and will be the leading country of securing our security in our region as well as a leading country in NATO. So thank you. Mr. Vargas. Well, thank you so much for the question. Um, I can tell you that the, uh, the line in the budget um, that passed uh, recently and you know, has been passing you know, for a number of years already s symbolizes that, at least for, for, for me personally, the irreplaceability of uh, United States as the partner when it comes to our region's security and defense. Um, and you know, colleagues very, very well mentioned that you know we're doing our part. Definitely, all all three of us. And if you would look at the broader region, you would you know you would sense a trend there. You know, take take Poland and Romania and, and all of this doing pretty much pretty much the same thing. But when when we think about uh, dangers on the other side of the border, when we see the numbers of potential Russian troops, when we've seen Wagner you know assembling. Uh, just outside Lithuania's border and, and the Polish border, we do understand that if, if NATO were to, be, were to be tested, if we were to have to defend our countries, um, in order to be secure, in order to save our countries, in order to save NATO, we have to do it together. And uh, therefore, we're grateful. You know, we're grateful for um, for the financial support. That is, uh, most of it goes to. Uh, to purchasing U.S. equipment here in, in the United States. Uh, but we're also uh, grateful for the boots on the ground. And uh, all our three countries have a contingent of U.S. troops. In our case, it's in, in Pabrade, which is just a couple of kilometers away from, from Belarus. And we still do believe that it's the greatest deterrent there is, uh, working together with our main transatlantic partner. Um, Mr. Carnes. In Latvia, and actually this is for all three of you, but uh, I did want to just pause for a second um, because we all had the, the pleasure of speaking moments before we were out here. Um, so I feel like I know all of you three at this point, but I'm not sure everyone in our audience does. So just to repeat, um, directly to my left is uh, the Foreign Minister of Latvia, Christianis Karns. And I will start, introduce each of you as we go along. Um, on uh, Friday, 
Moscow's concert hall was brutally attacked by ISIS. And it took less than a day for Putin to suggest that maybe this was connected to Ukraine. Uh, how do each of you feel about the, the idea that Putin could potentially use this to further expand his aggression in Ukraine, or if possibly even worse, um, assert that maybe there was a connection to one of your three countries? Uh, well, we immediately uh, denounced uh, the terrorist attack. Terrorism uh, is terrorism. But uh, the reaction of Putin and of Russia uh, is if it's not clear to anyone what kind of country or regime we're dealing with, uh, this is a brutal regime which is on the march, literally. Uh, this year, they will be spending about 40% of their budget on defense and internal security. That is money that they're not spending on hospitals, on roads, on schools, on social welfare. They're spending it for the war effort the war of aggression. It's a good old-fashioned imperialistic war. And uh, they are trying to annihilate uh, Ukraine, thank God, unsuccessfully. But of course, Ukraine needs our support in order to uh, prevail uh, in, this, uh, in this war against them. But uh, we see also that uh, Putin will use um, any uh, excuse uh, to uh, try to um, uh, you know, vilify Ukraine uh, or any and all NATO countries at the same time. That's simply the facts that we're dealing with. They are quite brutal. Um, and, uh, uh, but I, I think it's, what, it's, it's sort of a wake-up call, the recent so-called elections. So Putin engineered non-democratic elections to make sure that he has a mandate or claims a mandate for the next six years. But what does that mean for us? It means let's assume that there will be no change. This regime will not be changing in the next six years. I'm guessing it'll be much longer than that. And that means we need to build a strategy, not just for helping Ukraine now, but how to deal with Russia uh, over the next 20 years. We've been in NATO for 20, so let's look at the next 20 years. Let's figure out how to deal with Russia, how to deter them from ever looking NATO's way. And the way to do that is through being strong and to be transparently strong, so also the Russians can see the number of troops, the kinds of weapons, the, the exercises we're going through, so that, God forbid, they wouldn't make a miscalculation, as they actually did in Ukraine, thinking falsely that they're weak and it's an easy take. Two, more than two years later, they're not doing well in this war. Uh, they are actually getting quite slaughtered. Unfortunately, they're also slaughtering Ukrainian uh, civilians and civilian infrastructure. Uh, and uh, that's just the kind of um, adversary that we're up against. But we need to wake up to the fact that it's there and it's going to be there for the long term. Minister Sakna, um, what struck me is, as Estonia's foreign minister, I think you may have put your statement out even possibly before Putin put out a statement, even suggesting potentially that this was a likelihood, that they would, he would find a way to blame Ukraine. Um, what made you think that, and what do you think happens next? Yes, of course, all the terroristic attacks we condemn totally. But we don't know the objective information, really, what happened in Russia and what has happened and what will happen in Russia. So <clears throat> we have witnessed as well from the past that Russia and Putin is using the same terroristic uh, steps or, or actions sometimes uh, for the purpose of the personal ideas uh, to restore the imperial, what they, what they had in the Soviet Union. So uh, it is not, it's never clear actually what is happening in Russia. But also what we witness in Baltic states, when I can talk about Estonia, we have uh, made 10 arrests during the last more than two months in Estonia, in the country of NATO, uh, about the personnel who actually attacked or planned to attack the, the public uh, person's assets. So one example was our Minister of Interior personal car, which was destroyed. And this is a very clear link uh, to Russian special forces and services. So Russia is using any kind of opportunities to turn up the different societies, to, to spread the fear, to make us all unstable. 
And of course, uh, Putin is using all the opportunities to blame Ukraine in whatever bad experiences uh, they are like uh, uh, putting in public. Uh, about these fake elections, actually these elections, so-called, I cannot uh, call them elections actually, the nomination, on whatever we call, in Russia, they were not the first ones. But uh, what I was expecting, and we see now as well, that Putin is using more uh, stronger uh, vocabulary. So he changed as well from the special operation, now they call this aggression to Ukraine, it's a war. So probably soon we will have, uh, we, we can see the full-scale mobilization in Russia. So they have not mobilized officially uh, the troops. So we'll see that as well. And of course, uh, Putin has uh, put the war machine in full scale. So now it is very active and it won't stop uh, without that, uh, that Ukraine will win. And that's the reason why we need to support uh, Ukraine uh, constantly, because this is a threat for all of us. It's like the, the, this is attack against uh, the roots, what we have created. And we have to understand that as well. And also we see during the last uh, days the, the heaviest attacks during the nights against the infrastructure, against the civilians of, through the bombings. So we see that intensity is going up. So we need to understand that uh, the, the rapid support to Ukraine is, is crucial for now as well. And Putin is using every angle to blame Ukrainians and we cannot follow this kind of fake uh, narratives. Thank you. Mr. Landsbergis, um, I actually want to pivot uh, for a question in Lithuania. Alexei Navalny's former chief of staff, Leonid Volkhod, was brutally attacked in Vilnius. How unsettling was that attack for your population? Can the Kremlin attack inside Lithuania at will? Well, I would follow up from, from what uh, Margus said about uh, um, detained people in, in Estonia. Uh, I think there were, have been a couple in, in, in Latvia and Poland as well. Um, we know for a fact that there is an active kinetic activity happening in the Baltic states and the wider region today. Russia is able to have people for hire that would, in some cases, vandalize um, uh, buildings, you know, tear down the flags, such things have, have happened in, in Lithuania, and attack people. So we, you know, the, the message that is, is taken from it, that we have to really be vigilant. And when we hear, you know, saying, somebody saying, look, Russia is, you know, overwhelmed in Ukraine, they, they're stuck there, you know, they're not doing so well, no, all of this is true. But still, we, we, we cannot let down the fact that you know, they have the capacity to be active elsewhere. They militarily are active in, in Ukraine, but with hybrid activities, they're able to reach out to, to the Baltic states. And I think that whenever we talk about the dangers to NATO and to NATO countries, first of all, we have to talk about hybrid activities. And we have to have a response to that as well, because this is an escalation. We cannot be constantly just in de-escalating mood wherever something is, is, is happening. We have to start having an answer if, if, these, if these things uh, happen in, in our countries. Because they are pushing the line. They are testing us. Uh, and um, and I, I'm sure that somewhere down the line we have to start pushing, pushing back. Um, I, I visited uh, Leonid at, uh, at his home. I mean, it is honestly scary. Um, you know, his, his family's out there, you know, his, uh, his kids and, and, and wife. And somebody waited for him, knowing very well where, where he stays, where he lived, um, and chose the way to attack so that it, it you know, it, it sends a message to all the opposition, because in Lithuania there is quite a lot of Russian and Belarusian opposition residing. Um, knowing very well what kind of message it will, it will be sent. So, of course, I mean, from our side, um, the criminal police is, is on the case, all the institutions are working. I'm sure that you know, the, the people who actually did uh, the attack, that they will be found. But for us, as a politician, it's very important to go after the ones that order it. 
It's worrisome that you say that there's already kinetic attacks going yeah. on inside your borders. Uh, do you see the same thing happening in Estonia right now? Uh, we see the will and we see the movements, but I can say as well that Estonian uh, agencies and secret police is working really well, and we decided that we have this policy to make everything public. We, we make everything public uh, because everybody must know as well that uh, we are able to respond. So, and of course, I just had a meeting with uh, the Russian opposition leaders as well in Estonia last week, and we said as well that uh, please let us know if they, they feel unsafe or if they, if they recognize something, because we know that uh, Russian special services are active in our region, outside from Europe, inside uh, NATO. So we must understand that very clearly, that this is not, uh, this is not something like normal because uh, Russia is trying to attack us all. Uh, the main goal is to how to, uh, how to create the instability in our societies. So uh, just in one example, that a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had uh, <clears throat> the historic, uh, the largest uh, cyber attack against Estonian uh, governmental uh, domain, which we are holding the, uh, the most of our public services online. Uh, we have a, uh, 98% of public services online. Estonia is pretty well uh, developed on digital uh, services. And if you can imagine that within uh, four hours, we got uh, three billion, not million, but billion requests uh, in a row to, to just hack down our, uh, the main, main uh, domain, and we just got rid of that. So uh, it, it is something what is happening 24-7 in our region. So we have to watch carefully what is going on, and it is not only a problem of Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, but I'm happy that we have an allies here as well, backing us up to, to gather the information. So, but this is like the so-called everyday life in our region, unfortunately. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what happens if Ukraine falls. What happens if USA gets there too late? What happens if uh, Russia is able to achieve more of its military objectives. What does that mean for your countries? And Mr. Carnes, I'll start with you. Uh, well, first, I think we all have to uh, really understand and appreciate uh, that the Ukrainians are not uh, thinking or in the mood of giving up. So they need uh, our support. They need weapons. They need ammunition. But... Uh, they have uh, uh, the spirit to continue the fight, and I have no doubt that they will do this. Um, what's at stake is essentially the order of the world and U.S. credibility. Uh, the U.S. created a rules-based system at the end of the Second World War with the United Nations, uh, all the charters, human rights, etc., uh, which is at the core of it all. And uh, that is now being challenged. It's actually being challenged around the world. It's not only Russia. So we see some, how should we call it um, correctly, saber rattling in China. We see what's happening in the Philippines, Taiwan Strait, uh, freedom of navigation. Um, uh, this is being challenged. And uh, some uh, disquieting rhetoric, I think, is coming from there. Russia is not rattling sabers. It's fighting an outright war in Europe. And if thuggery wins in one place, while well, the other despots around the world are all looking to see what happens. Oh, Russia got away with that, so maybe I can get away with something else. And we already see there's a very clear three countries that are working together, Russia, Iran, and North Korea, with North Korea and Iran providing weapons to Russia for Russia to kill Ukrainians. So that's already clearly happening, and we know Iran's role in the Middle East and uh, in the, uh, the hostilities, the war that is uh, going on there with the Houthis and Hezbollah and Hamas. Um, I think uh, North Korea um, is a challenge to the world. Uh, their march towards uh, uh, nuclear weapons and, and all the testings firing even over uh, Japan uh, we see that as well, and we see the disquieting, growing, it seems, relationship between 
China and Russia, not with arms deliveries at this point, but with seeming support for technologies that Russia uses in its military industry, a way to avoid Western sanctions. Uh, so what's at stake uh, is our entire way of life. And it's not only about Ukraine or only about Europe. It is a lot to do with uh, the role of the US and the credibility of the US and the rules-based system that uh, uh, this uh, country has been uh, underpinning uh, uh, since the end of the Second World War. Um, combined uh, in NATO, we have a 25-time economic potential larger than Russia's. It's no challenge. But what is the challenge is making sure the political will is there to follow through. We have the, the might and the ability. We just have to make sure that political will from all sides uh, is there. And uh, we cannot afford the world where Russia is allowed to succeed in Ukraine. And I would say allowed because it is in our combined ability to aid Ukraine so that Russia not only is doing poorly today, but that they ultimately and completely fail. I would like to, Mr. Lemsburgis, uh, what would that mean if Russia did um, begin some sort of ground assault, move forward, what does that mean for the Swalky Gap? And what sort of defenses are you putting in place if Ukraine falls? Well, you know, one of the messages that we, uh, I can say, we three brought with us here to Washington is, um, you know, first of all, we have to have a plan how Ukraine does not fall. <laughs> that's, that's the imperative. Um, probably where we're, you know, where we have a bit of difficulties understanding how we're planning to win with just enough that is being given to, to Ukraine currently. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, I don't think that we should be really actively uh, communicating the idea of Ukraine falling. Because this is such a nightmare scenario that actually destroys the whole security architecture, not just in Europe but globally. And um, if there are countries current and there are countries who depend from the order uh, that is created you know, by, by the leadership of, of the United States and the countries are you know, in Japan and in South Korea, uh, Philippines and, you know, and, and, and many, many more, then all of that order is being, uh, being underwritten. And that's you know, to prepare for something like that, I mean, then you have to start not a new chapter, not a new page, but actually a new book. <laughs> a new history book would be, would be written there. So our message, you know, with us that we brought here, we have to win. There can't be no plan B, because if the plan A doesn't work, then this is it. If Russians do not stop, and they, I don't see them, you know, having a plan to stop, Honestly, I don't, I don't see them kind of saying, okay, we look, you know, we'll just continue for a couple of more kilometers and then this is, this is it. I don't think so. <clears throat> they, they have a plan to go on as much as we would allow them to. And we, in turn, in turn are allowing a little bit because, you know, Ukrainians are holding, and my colleagues were very, you know, specific about this, that they have all the political will. They have all the ability, all the capacity, all the knowledge to hold the line and push Russians out. But if we don't provide them enough ammunition, it's a miracle that they're still doing it. Because you cannot stop tanks just with your bare hands. I mean, it's, it just doesn't work like that. So if, if, I mean, if Russians would continue their, their assault, so many other countries are in danger. And first of all, those who are not covered by Article 5. This is Georgia and Moldova, where we already have uh, Russian-occupied territories or Russian contingents being placed, such as in, in, in Moldovan region of Transnistria. Um, and then, yes, the question is, you know, can they, test, can they test NATO? And honestly, I mean, two years ago, uh, I mean, even a year ago, many of us would have said, look, no, that's, there's no chance. Nobody would believe that. I don't think that we have this strong conviction right now. If they're victorious, able to rebuild, 
who knows where they would, where they would end up. And as, as Christian has very well mentioned, I mean, it emboldens others, right? The whole loss of credibility, of Western credibility, it emboldens others. So if, if Russians are able to do what they're doing in Ukraine, why shouldn't we do something like that elsewhere? And we're already seeing that. You know, the, this bellicose mode and rhetoric in Indo-Pacific, in, uh, uh, in Caucasus, in, uh, you know, in regions of uh, Middle East and wherever, I mean, you see the change that this is it, this might be the hour when the West is weak enough for us to try, to try and, and, and write, uh, write our own um, you know, page in, in, in world's history. And we cannot allow that to happen. It's just too precious. Do you think there's will within NATO to admit Ukraine? And how do each of you feel about admitting Ukraine? If you'd like to go for it, that's fine. <clears throat> we are so like-minded, we're just uh, adding more uh, facts, actually. Uh, the case is that uh, the first thing, uh, Putin had a plan about one week, uh, special operation in Ukraine, and he was totally miscalculating. Now we have a third year of full-scale war, and Ukraine is fighting like hell, and actually uh, regain a lot of territories they lost in the beginning of this aggression. They have a uh, success at Black Sea, really, really. Please write more about that without actually having uh, uh, like lots of, lots of capabilities. But actually, Russia is pushed out from the uh, strategic uh, regions of Black Sea. So they have a will. They have an, all the opportunities and knowledge. But they just lack of ammunition and weapons. And that's what we can, we can give. And it is the most cheapest and most efficient way to support Ukraine instead of having this uh, kind of maybe NATO test and whatever in our territories. Uh, what about NATO? NATO is stronger, NATO is solid, NATO is united, a huge military power. And uh, we have no doubt that Article 5 will work if there is a need for that. But I, I, I totally agree with, uh, with my colleagues that the case is that Putin is, he has started its uh, historical war, reestablishing the, uh, re the Soviet Union empire. So this is not like a rational thing to do. But now he has changed the society. He has changed all his, its economy <clears throat> and mentality in Russia. So he cannot stop, because we know very well that from Kremlin, people are not going normally to, to pensions. You know. They're not retiring, they're, they're, they're probably, you know, we know the future of Putin, so he will continue, probably. So <clears throat> what we see uh, from our perspective is that everything will work, all the military capabilities will be there in our territories, except we don't know exactly what is going to happen, but if the deterrence doesn't work, then if Putin will just make a NATO test, so we will have the victorious conflict, and NATO will win, definitely, no problem. But in Estonia, in Latvia, Lithuania, we have 200 kilometers uh, strategic depth, and everything will happen in our territories. And we are the part of the democratic world. And also, we have US troops there, we have British, we have all the NATO allies there. And my question is, to my colleagues in NATO as well, whether we would, would like to have this kind of risk in reality for the future, or let's get rid of uh, Putin's aggression, will of aggression, now when Ukrainians are fighting and ready to fight. And instead of uh, having this kind of uh, perspective, just to invest to Ukraine, to support Ukraine financially, militarily, and push Russia back, and also take away the will of aggression for the future. So this is how we see it. <clears throat> and uh, we have a we have all the money in the world, but one, one topic we, we discussed today as well with the Secretary Blinken is that uh, actually our taxpayers, they don't have to pay for the restoration of, of Ukraine or support Ukraine because we have uh, Russian frozen assets. We have uh, public assets, we have their bank assets, also we have oligarchs' assets. So this is one thing that the US is leading as well uh, on G7 level and we all trying to do as well on European level that how can we use the Russian frozen assets? We have hundreds of billions dollars worth assets. And uh, the, the main rule is that aggressor must pay. 
Putin must pay. In Estonia, we are having now uh, in Parliament, uh, in the middle of the process, to adopt the law about how can we use the Russian frozen assets even during the war. This is like the case for everybody, that it can be used as well on the international level. So, and what I, I, I felt, and also there are evidences, that it makes Russia so much worried that every time they are reacting, if we are moving forward with this law draft. Because one thing is that we are taking away of uh, the Russian money and assets, but many of these assets belong to the oligarchs who are surrounding Putin. And we have to take away the understanding that business as usual can continue after this war for them as well. Because they are living in the fear of losing their assets, their money, which they have robbed together uh, you know, from the Russian people, actually, to be honest. So we have many, many topics we can actually deal with to support Ukraine instead of actually having this kind of conflict uh, in front of us all together as, a, as a one family. <clears throat> and finally as well, China, North Korea, or not democratic countries are watching carefully what will be the result of this Russian aggression. And if Russia will win, or we will have any kind of so-called ceasefire that actually they can declare that actually Russia was winning. So this is a clear sign that actually different non-democratic countries, they can change the borders using force. They can break all the laws in the, in, in interna on the international law level. So this is like the green light. And then it is more expensive for all of us, for all of us. Minister Landsbergis, I know you have a plane to catch in about yes. five minutes, so I want to give you one more question that will be for all three of you, but start with you. Um, how concerned are you that given the November US elections, the country may vote to return uh, Donald Trump to office, who has said previously, you know, he's threatened that maybe the US NATO members may not be protected. He's taken that back. but. What sort of concern has that generated in your country? Well, um, first of all, we focus on the things that we can have effect on. Uh, we are not voting in the US election. It's up to you. Uh, and we'll respect any decision that you're going to make. The only things that we can do, um, I would point out two. First, is tell our story. And this is what we three have been doing throughout our time here. Um, and the story is not just about today. It's not just about Ukraine. It's not just about uh, you know, recent event. But it's also about our independence and freedom um, that we got uh, you know, and, and fought for and, and gained three decades ago with the US leadership. And. Um, and we managed to maintain it. We managed to transform our countries, you know, in, from what was post-Soviet, and still sometimes mentioned like that, we don't like it, um, into modern, thriving, democratic, and free societies of, of, of Baltic, Baltic region. And um, we are proud about it, but there is also a point where you can be proud about it. As, as a country, as a society who stood shoulder to shoulder with us throughout our journey. The second thing is, it's more to do with, uh, with current time, is uh, that we're carrying our weight. I know there's a lot of disappointment and in some cases even uh, misunderstanding as to what Europe is doing when it comes to Ukraine. Um, and we, we want to make it very clear that we, we, we are carrying our weight. We don't want to, to be freeloading. We don't want to, you know, to, uh, uh, to just care about our you know, well-being and, and social security when we cannot be telling the story that we care about our security as well. We do understand that Article 3 comes before Article 5, and we take that responsibility very strongly and very clearly. So that goes about us. Uh, same thing can be said about Ukraine. You will be seeing three our countries standing in front whenever things have to be done for Ukraine and rallying others. 
So I think that it's, this is important, and it's important to either administration that is, that is formed uh, after, after the election, because um, the electors have these questions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because they do not necessarily get the latest information from Europe, they not necessarily do understand the, you know, the thinking behind the you know, decisions that are being made on the other side of the Atlantic, and it's, it's important to tell that, um, that without the partnership, Europe is weaker, Without the partnership, U.S. is weaker. And uh, for partnership to be stronger, we're ready to delve apart. Thank you. I believe it's either on the nose 315 or very, very close, which is, uh, I think, time for you to catch your plane. Thank, so yeah. Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. And we'll continue. We just want to give him a moment to uh, depart. So we can continue our conversation. Um, how is the conversation going within both of your countries with your taxpayers, your voters, on continuing to shoulder the burden to support Ukraine? Uh, are you seeing a continued will? Has that will increased? Or like we have seen in the US, um, there are competing concerns. And our, population, our states have competing concerns. And there are voter concerns that maybe you don't want to send all of this money to Ukraine because you've got needs in your backyard. Are you facing those same challenges? I can, I can start. Uh, happily, we don't have any change uh, of a decrease of support of Ukraine during the last uh, two or more years. Even uh, we can say that now we have like 3.6% of our population uh, we are refugees from Ukraine. And we have opened all our social, uh, economic, uh, social educational systems uh, and the labor market to the Ukraine refugees, to their families and children. And uh, we are able to, to welcome them more. Uh, because we have been under the Soviet occupation for 50 years. And during these times, we lost one-fifth of our population and people. And, and uh, our families and younger people as well, they know the stories. And they know exactly the same thing is going on now in Ukraine. Just the one example is, we know by name more than 20,000 deported children in Ukraine. Ukrainians are saying that actually there's more than 200,000. But actually the Russians, the Putin says, that actually it's like 700,000. Can you imagine deported uh, children today, 21st century? So we know what, what is coming, what may come. And that's the reason uh, our society is, is fully supporting. So uh, I mentioned as well, we have given 1.5% uh, of uh, GDP military support. But I'm not uh, mentioning the humanitarian support, and it is mainly given by Estonian people, the private sector, the NGOs, and, and also personally. So, and we will continue that, and we, we, are, we, are, we are continuing that all the same, I think, in Latvia, Lithuania, because we understand that this is, this is crucial. This is uh, this the help for, for Ukrainians, are actually, we are helping ourselves as well. And, and the background is that we still remember the times when we didn't have freedom. And this is something I'm a bit con concerned that people globally in democratic countries are taking uh, freedom as granted democracy is granted. But today we have to fight for freedom. We have to stand for freedom. And this uh, value-based uh, policies is not only talks. It is, it is practical thing. Because uh, I think that the end of this war will declare as well where are the, the borders of non-democratic countries and democratic countries and societies. So this is something why, why I, I, I'm very happy to be the foreign minister of Estonia, because uh, I can rely on Estonian people. We have no debates on that. But as well, there are like the, the not so pleasant parts. The GDP, why I'm talking about GDP? GDP is an honest figure. GDP in smaller countries per capita is the same as GDP in the bigger countries. We have also the uh, medical systems and social systems and pensions and everything, and education, we have to pay for that. So in Estonia, we have increased taxes. We have increased taxes because of the defense investments. And we probably will 
this government will introduce the next uh, defense tax as well. Not permanent, but we understand we must invest more. Even we're putting 3.2% right now, but uh, in the long range, we have to just invest to our defense. I cannot say that these decisions are popular, but people understand very well that without that, we, we are not able to, to survive in the meaning of, of uh, increasing our capabilities together with all the allies. We must understand as well that uh, uh, even our GDPs all together are not big ones, but we, we do our burden more, a lot more actually than many others. But uh, we have this constant understanding of what is going on and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the price, about the price in the future we may pay all together. And instead of that, I think that Estonian people are pretty clever that it is time to invest right now than to wait the unknown future. So I think this mentality is still there and it is not changing. Yes. Minister. Have you had the ongoing conversations within your population? Do you still have to convince people to either increase taxes or continue to support Ukraine at the level you have? Within Latvia, as in Estonia, and I think in Lithuania, uh, this is not uh, a political debate. Uh, the support for Ukraine is, is wholehearted, uh, not only for the government, but also for civil society. So as the government continues to uh, uh, provide all sorts of aid, including, of course, military aid. Civil society has been providing uh, basically everything under the sun. The creativity of our society uh, is, is quite astounding. Uh, from um, older people getting together and, and making camouflage knitting for the frontline troops uh, to um, uh, garage industries growing up with ever more innovative ways to provide um, heating and light sources for the soldiers in the trenches through providing uh, medical uh, equipment, um, all sorts of vehicles, ambulances, buses, uh, etc. The government, we uh, took a decision uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, in order to fight uh, drunk driving, uh, which is now thankfully uh, going much less, we said that we will confiscate automobiles when there's a certain amount of, of, of alcohol involved. And then uh, we said we will not only confiscate these automobiles, but we will provide them to Ukraine. Uh, so in a sense, uh, the elements of our society which are you know, causing problems, well, we actually figured out a way to have them help Ukrainians as well. Uh, so uh, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, now there's ever fewer cars to confiscate. But uh, there was even an effort among um, drunk drivers uh, to help Ukrainians. That's, it's true, it's a, with a little bit of, of humor as well. But um, our society, <coughs> see, it's what Margus said. We have a collective memory of occupation and deportation and deprivations that occurred in our countries following the end of the Second World War. So when the rest of Europe and the United States celebrates Victory in Europe Day. For us, it was simply the beginning of another extremely brutal occupation. And I've been to Bucha in, uh, just outside of uh, Kiev and, and have spoken with people and, and, and you know, they, show the, they show you on their telephones the photographs and, and the stories. And they're the same stories that we've heard from our uh, uh, parents or grandparents. Uh, from the 1940s into the 1950s of what happened under Soviet occupation in our countries. So it's, it's, it's not something that we need to convince. and It's, it's, it's not decreased at all. We look at, uh, uh, we're politicians, we follow polls as well. And this is one of the numbers which simply does not change. And if anything, uh, support is even growing. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's very clear. Just a few minutes left, so I wanted to first thank you both for being part of this conversation with us today. Thank you. Um, and before I ask the final question, just a few housekeeping notes. I just wanted to thank the organizers of today's event, um, headliner co-team leaders Donna Lewin Lier, Lori Russo and Judd Judson, club member Molly McCluskey, National Press Club program manager Cecily Scott Martin, 
and Club Executive Director Didier Sahi. So uh, we do have a tradition here where each of our guests gets an official National Press Club coffee mug, which I'm honored to give to both of you. And I forgot, yes, you bolted out the door, I forgot to give him one for the plane, so maybe I could give you the third. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So for our final question, in our, in our final two, three minutes I think we have left, if you could tell the US Congress one thing right now as they debate the Ukraine aid bill, what would it be? I would say that what is at stake is uh, US credibility and US strength around the world. Uh, and the aid uh, which we hope will go to a vote in Congress uh, soon is uh, not only about uh, Ukraine, but it is about also the US. And uh, the world needs the US as, I believe, US needs the rest of the world. Uh, and this vote and this aid is, uh, will have a direct positive uh, effect on the war in Ukraine because we know that the Ukrainians have the spirit, have the skills, have the will to put up the fight. They simply need the weapons and the ammunition, the tools to do the job. I would like to say that I think that people sometimes, uh, today's communication, are thinking that the aggression uh, against Ukraine is just like the, another war movie you can rent from different, uh, I don't know, Netflix and whatever. <coughs> and it's normally lasting like uh, two hours and 30 minutes. And then you have like a script that, uh, you know, somebody's winning and somebody's losing and there are heroes. And the feeling is something like this, that now we have watched this movie already uh, like two hours and 10 minutes and now we have 20 minutes left and there will be happy end. But this is not the movie. This is a reality. And at stake, we have no uh, just like the situation uh, and, and the future of Ukraine people, but uh, at stake we have uh, the system we are relying on. We are enjoying that, the, the longest uh, peace period in our societies ever. And uh, if we are not now making these kind of decisions, if we are not writing the history in the good ways, then in the future, I don't know how to explain to our voters all, I'm not talking about the US only, but, but globally, Voters we have only in democratic uh, systems. Voters we don't have in non-democratic systems. So how can we explain them that we made a big mistake right now when we had all the opportunities, we had all the resources, we have all the money in the world to invest to our future? That is my, my question, actually. So I do hope that uh, US people, people in Europe, people in democracies <coughs> are understanding that this is not just another war movie. We have all our lifestyle at stake. And sometimes it is hard to recognize when is the historical momentum, but the historical momentum is right now here, and we have to decide all together. Thank you. Ministers, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and your perspectives with us. Uh, and for that, that wraps up our latest newsmaker. Thank you for joining us so much today. And uh, I will go back to the podium to gavel us out. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We are concluded.